Our presenter today is Dr. Lisa Merriweather, a research professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her research focuses on the issues of equity and social justice within the historical discourse of adult education, informal education, and doctoral education. She explores the critical philosophy and sociology of race and anti-Black racism and employs Africana philosophy, critical race theory, and qualitative and historical methodologies to investigate topics found at the nexus of race and adult education. Dr. Mary Weather, it is truly an honor to have you with us today, coming from one of your former doctoral students. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to you by sharing your introductory video. of minds, bodies, and human rights, stripped of bloodlines, whipped and confined, this is the American pride. It's justifying a genocide, romanticizing the theft and bloodshed that made America the land of the free, to take a black life, land of the free, to bring a gun to a peaceful fight for civil rights. You are desensitized to pulling triggers on innocent lives because that's how we got here in the first place. These wounds sink deeper than the bullet your entitled hands could ever reach. Generations and generations of pain, fear, and anxiety. Equality is walking without intuition, saying the protector and the killer is wearing the same uniform. The revolution is not televised. Media perception is forced down the throats of closed minds, so it's lies in the headlines and generations of supremacy resulting in your ignorant, privileged eyes. We breathe the same and we bleed the same, but still we don't see the same. Be thankful we are God-fearing because we do not seek revenge, we seek justice. We are past fear, we are fed up eating your shit because you think your so-called black friend validates your wokeness and erases your racism. That kind of uncomfortable conversation is too hard for your trust fund pockets to swallow. To swallow the strange fruit hanging from my family tree because of your audacity to say all men are created equal in the eyes of God but disparage a man based on the color of his skin. Do not say you do not see color. When you see us, see us. We can't breathe. Dr. Merriweather, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Hopefully you all are seeing the right slides, like right part of the slides. So happy morning to everyone. I extend my appreciation to Dr. Amber Bryant for recommending me to, um, as a potential speaker for this impressive data fair. I am uh, humbled and honored. I am Dr. Lisa Merriweather, and I have engaged in qualitative research as an empirical data approach to knowledge production for many years. About two weeks ago, I participated in the scholar strike 
action initiative. At the end of the Arizona State University Day of Virtual Teach-Ins, they played I Can't Breathe by her. As I prepared for this presentation, it struck me that this is at the heart of why race still matters in qualitative research and why we need to look deeply and frequently into how we are complicit. We need to ask whose neck is our knee as researchers standing on and in what ways do our ontological commitments both knowingly and unknowingly contribute to choking the life out of communities of color? How can we better respond to the, to the limit, I can't breathe, and create uncomfortable conversations with ourselves and through our research? In this presentation, I will talk about race-based epistemologies and ontological commitments when researching without numbers. Research Without Numbers, my slides do not seem to be moving here. Right, there we go. Researching Without Numbers is one way that qualitative research uh, has been characterized. While qualitative is not known for crunching numbers, numbers certainly have a place within the research approach, but it is more often associated with empirical data that comes in other forms. It is an umbrella term used to capture a variety of design strategies used to engage in-depth, rich ex exploration, description, and interpretation of life worlds through words, observations, and texts and artifacts. Qualitative research is employed across a range of disciplines and has been called on to investigate a wide variety of topics. One topic that will no doubt see a spike in interest as a result of the increased awareness around racial just injustice is race. Previous to this, there had been, for a number of years, a declining significance of race in the eyes of some, mostly situated in racially privileged positions. Vargas refers to race as a social phenomenon that is experienced subject sub subjectively. When theorists assert that race is socially constructed, she says, what they mean is that race is an objective phenomenon that has no positive or negative implication until cultural or social practices provide that social meaning. Over 25 years ago, Cornell West affirmed that race still matters, a phrase that is ever more apparent in 2020. He links the significance of race to white supremacist ideology, which he says, is based first and foremost on the degradation of black bodies in order to control them. There is also an emphasis that is shared by Lord, Hooks, Kendi, Woodson, among others, that these phenomena are historically rooted and deeply entrenched in the formation and development of the United States. A group of scholars known as critical race theorists have for decades sought to highlight and further understand how race functions in society, how it is embedded in the norms and assumptions of the everyday, and how it is invisibilized in the face of tangible evidence that people of color as a whole are systematically disadvantaged by the race rules that govern instruction standards, structure standards, laws, and mores, resulting in the minoritization of people of color. Race and racism are the unrecognized and unattended to filters through which society operates and claims positions of neutrality. According to critical race theorists, racism is globally endemic and ubiquitous, qualities that are particularly acute in the United States, and, and it disproportionately influences the lives of black and brown people. Raced people certainly have been the subject of qualitative inquiry, but qualitative inquiry has less often been subject to a race analysis. In the pivotal edition edited volume titled Interrogating Racism and Qualitative Research, published in 2003, Vargas asserted that race should be centered in research, qualitative research as well as quantitative research, because as Lopez and Parker add, an analysis of how race mediates and or intersects with the research process is currently missing. Challenging epistemologies theories and methodologies that privilege some at the, at the expense of others and, take, uh, and rest in taking for granted assumptions about people groups and their life worlds 
should be paramount in the research enterprise. Creating spaces for developing theories and theorizing about the space and place of white valorization and black and brown denigration are obligations of qualitative researchers who are compelled to center race within the discourse of research. Qualitative research often falls prey to the assumption of positive intent. It has in recent years been crafted as having egalitarian, democratic, and socially just aims as scholars who typically employ it, uh, who, and the scholars who typically employ it subscribe to critical postmodern and emancipatory theories. We use words like participants instead of subjects to refer to those whom we are gathering data from. We explore issues related to social justice, and we identify our back biases, checking them at the front door of our research endeavors. Qualitative research in large measure has been construed as a site of transformation, progress, and growth through the development of knowledge through the research process. There is an assumption of positive intent but it is plagued by the question, is it, is it a positive impact? Or, and if so, for whom, as defined by who? Take, for example, these popular images used to delineate the difference between equality and equity. In the first, there is no positive intent, nor positive impact. In the second, one might assume positive intent, but the methodology and methods are diversive and assume a deficit approach. Those needing the additional blocks are, def are deficient and lacking. Moreover, even though they get to see, they still have to exert more energy and effort to do so. The last image might say, some might say, expresses positive intent and positive improved outcome. Each can see without additional aids. The barrier was removed. That is, the environment was changed and the change was not expected to come from the affected individuals. But as students in my class recently brought up, even the last image is not true liberation or emancipation because they are all positioned outside of the stadium, not seated within it. An image showing them inside would better demonstrate positive intent and positive outcome with transformative and critical impact. I put forth that qualitative research lies somewhere in the images of equity and full liberation, particularly when it comes to wrestling with issues of race and racism in the discipline. In this presentation, I seek to highlight the varied ways that race operates in qualitative research, continuing the dialogue of how race functions in qualitative inquiry. This is not to suggest that quantitative research is exempt or immune from these critiques as it has historically operated from ideas such as generalization and universalism, more often hiding race than illuminating it. I will spotlight two aspects of qualitative research, epistemology and interpersonal contextualization. Epistemology refers to knowledge, its nature, origins, and limits. Knowledge is value latent and has power. T.O. wrote that epistemological violence involves a subject, an object, and an action. And within the world of research, those items correspond to the researcher, those deemed as other, and the interpretation of data that is presented as knowledge. He goes on to say that epistemological violence refers to the interpretation of social scientific data on the other, and is produced when empirical data are interpreted, interpreted as showing the inferiority of the other, even when data allow for equally viable alternative interpretations. Interpretations of inferiority are understood as actions that have a negative impact because the interpretations of data emerge from an academic context and thus are presented as knowledge Teal has defined them as epistemologically violent actions. To decrease epistemological violence or epistemological racism, in the words of Shurik and Young, qualitative researchers need to think more deeply about the work, moving beyond the notion of doing qualitative research differently, that is, how we collect and analyze the data, to, as Vargas opines, producing a new kind of knowledge, outsider-centered knowledge, from a standpoint at which race is at the center. 
When race is permitted to occupy center stage, it can function as a reflecting pool through which researchers can assess traditional research activities and philosophical understandings which form the core of the discipline. For instance, epistemologies associated with research, such as objectivism, constructionism, subjectivism, realism, and relativism, present from a race-neutral position, a westernized stance that values individualism. That is, each is explained from the perspective of an individual drawing on themes of autonomy and control. These canonical frameworks structure how research is approached, what assumptions will be applied, and what is recognized as important, and what ultimately counts as knowledge, and the proper way of coming to know it. Going further, these canons are built from a white perspective of knowing and orienting reality, a knowing and reality that has consistently denied humanity to black people and other people of color, has denied the validity of their experiences and has actively moved to exclude rather than include them in the processes of knowledge formation. Stanfield more bluntly calls the existing canonical epistemologies insufficient and biased toward Eurocentric ideology guaranteeing the perpetuation of white privilege and reproduction of racism. Tyson underscores this point in saying that racism is ingrained in societal ideology and theories that support research epistemologies, resulting in, as she states, whiteness remaining centered in research, as it is the standard against which others are evaluated, thus retaining its control position through othering. In other words, these assumptions cannot be made visible from within the ideology itself. The invisibility of these principles arises from a blindness that fails to legitimate perspectives that are not beneficial to white society. Race-based epistemologies, therefore, are needed to disrupt our beliefs, practices, and theories about the nature of reality and what counts as truth and knowledge. They raise epistemological challenges through the power of critique brought to bear by centering race in the process, resulting in much needed acknowledgement of the racism embedded in the canons. And as Vargas states, can move to destabilize power edifices of truth and knowledge, which are uncritically accepted and used in qualitative research. Tyson concurs and pushes scholars claiming race-based epistemologies as their foundation to seriously question the normality of what she terms white research forms, to question the presumed right of whiteness being centered in the research enterprise. Because race and racism were normative and insidiously inform how society is structured, race-based epistemologies are needed to foreground how racialized experiences impact what we do and know. They must restructure how we come to know what we know, how we produce knowledge, Historically, it has been the experiences of white people that form the foundation of practice and theory. Because the experiences of whites are casted as universal and the standard for evaluating the experiences of others, interrogation of racialized experiences must include both that of white people and people of color. Race-based epistemologies help capture how race operated through those assumptions, norms, and established practices. Eradicating epistemological violence requires white researchers to own their racial privilege and be willing to decenter that racism, uh, the racism-laced epistemologies that have traditionally guided their research. Pillow asserts that race consistently occupies a status of privileged absence in knowledge construction. She states, because those researchers saw no need to address processes of racism and racialization in their research, and privileged because approaching uh, theory and research as if they were raceless perpetuates a reproduction of Eurocentric privilege, reinforcing its own assumed neutrality. Representing the other in race ways, legitimated and reinforced understandings of white experience and perspectives as normative. Increasingly, the white normative experience was seen as typical and universal and not the result of a particular race experience. Shifting from this as the norm presents a crisis of identity for whites as they often are then forced to reevaluate not just how they understand others, but also how they understand themselves at the level of epistemology, 
in much the same way that racialized others have always needed to do. Shifting our epistemological understandings away from being rooted in one type of experience creates space for epistemological understandings rooted in other types of experiences in ways that do not necessitate giving permission or authority for them to exist or seeking to be integrated into a small part of a bigger, much dominant whole. Race-based epistemologies do not exist as a reaction to hegemonic white experience-based epistemologies. They exist in their own right, legitimized by their history and humanity. As Pillow states, we are not asking permission to be the alternative to the standard, but rather are asserting the right to stand equally with the hegemonic sanctioned epistemologies. Race-based methodology, she says, offer an epistemological shift in how we know what we know, how we come to believe such knowledge, and how we use it in our daily lives, adding both depth and critique to the epistemological discursive field, as well as encouraging us to language differently how we position ourselves to the knowledge. Race-based epistemologies become the basis for theorizing the lived experiences of the racially minoritized other in a way that is not inherently violent to their personhood and communities. Race-based epistemologies proactively challenge and critique any practice, theory, or paradigm that participates in exclusion of people of color and the production of miseducation about people of color. While theories like critical theory and various forms of feminism seek to critique, they often do so from a race-neutral position, making them little better than the aforementioned canons. In a recently completed work, I operated from a race-based epistemology. I participated in a project focusing on gender injustices in museum spaces. I was the only Black female participant. My colleagues were white, hailing from Canada, Europe, and the US. I had to frequently call out the racism inherent in their feminist work, a call that was at times met with pushback. I argue that an analysis of gender injustice in the absence of an analysis of race in the other intersections was incomplete and privileged the experiences of white women who were typically the subject of their research. Race-based epistemologies move us to think differently about the nature of knowledge and our role in reproducing the status quo through a liberal colorblind, through a liberal colorblind frame. As Pillow stated, race-based epistemologies seek to question the structures, the language, and the practices that construct identity politics by challenging hegemonic structures, the symbols that maintain and perpetuate oppressive privilege and racism in our research paradigms. Race-based epistemologies position us to reorient how we think about and design our studies, how we think about and choose our topics, and how we think about and represent the knowledge we develop. Pillow made an interesting comment that speaks to the aspect of interpersonal contextualization in saying racialized hearing delimits how the race person could be heard. That is, she says, race-based methodologies acknowledge and understand that how we conduct research is connected to the kinds of questions we ask, how we ask them, and for what purpose, and that that purpose of doing research cannot be disconnected from epistemologies that guide our research. What we ask, how, and for what purpose are predicated on the ontological, ontological commitments that we hold. Harp and Steller asserts that ontological assumptions are part and parcel to the social science research, but researchers play, pay, play little more than lip service to it and fail to realize how ontological commitments impact their practice of research. The relationship is described as a triangle with the researcher, the research objects, and the context each occupying a side. This relationship is undervalued because researchers have superficial understandings of ontology. More often, it is understood as the nature of being, beliefs held about the world or worldviews, but these do not get at the underlying assumptions. Quine, in 1948, pro-offered a different view through the notion of ontological commitment. Harpesteller described his work in this way. First, he approached the question of ontology at a meta level, as he was not interested in determining what there is, but in analyzing what we say there is, or more precisely, in what we impute there is 
by means of our ordinary language usage. Secondly, he broke new ground for ontological reflection, focusing on science and scientific theories. Ontological assumptions are therefore considered as truth conditions, whereby truth is not understood in the sense of a correspondence claim, but a fulfillment condition. Ontological commitment is a commitment not to the physically experienced world, but to a world as logically presupposed within what we say. For me, that was a lot to digest. But when I came to, what I came to understand is that ontological commitments are seen in what we say and do, not what we claim to believe. Habermas breaks this down further through the concept of communicative actions that occur in the objective, subjective, and social worlds, that is, in the context and in the systems of their reference. It is the social world ruled by social conventions and normative rules and the objective world determined by truth and validity claims that speak most clearly to the ontological commitments of the qualitative researcher. Now, ontological commitments are not divorced from the world, and ontological claims are, are rooted in epistemic knowledge. Hoffensteller claims that these commitments are referential in nature, linked to society through knowledge, physical, and social context, and thereby they are referenced within and through a society that is entrenched in race and racism. Hoffensteller writes the following. It furthermore becomes evident that the established custom of making ontological assumptions in the empirical social sciences accomplishes a particular purpose that is not in first line to set out what socially exists. Instead, the actual function of these explicit ontological assumptions is to invoke dominant beliefs and interpretations about the epistemic community. By limiting ontological reflection to these epistemic frames, or epistemologies, innovative and creative thinking about the research object and how it can be modeled within research is hampered. Scholarly writing then becomes normal science. That is to say that it is, reproduces what its mental frame has already said. Moving toward a critical definition of ontology, Hoffensteller concludes that ontological claims are sets of beliefs, references, and commitments that social scientists implicitly or explicitly make about the nature of their epistemic objects. These claims become concretized in analysis and writing up of the findings, implicating every aspect of the research process. What does this move away from normal science mean for the discussion, for this discussion. For this, I turn to the work of Buinda. Buindia equates epistemological concerns with the sphere of the symbolic of representation. Our epistemologies have been informed by metaphors of self and society, both of which have been shaped and structured by social history. Buinda says, Metaphors come to comprise researchers' conceptual systems and structures. In another instance, he describes metaphors as products of the white social imaginary of racialized others. Both references, according uh, to Taylor, show how identity is partly shaped by recognition or by its absence, often by the misrecognition of others, or so a person or a group of people can suffer real damage as a result, real distortion, if the people or society around them mirror back to them a confining or demeaning or a contemptible picture of themselves. These metaphors, the social imaginary constructed, are the result of the ontological commitment the researcher has made to how to see and name the social, independent of what they actually are presented with in the research process. In other words, the ontological commitment overrides the data and guides the interpretive actions of the researcher. Clifford suggests that qualitative researchers cannot avoid ontological commitments because, as, as is stated, they cannot avoid expressive tropes, figures, figures, and allegories that select and impose meaning as they translate it, interpreting and, and interpreting and discourse producing beings bring to the processes of seeing, or that is conceptualizing, and formulating a narrative that imposes unconsciously many times a conceptual order. 
To me, this suggests that perhaps unconsciously, the metaphor, the social imaginary, are fixed and drive understanding, interpretation, and the ensuing discourse through the research process. The metaphor, in essence, defines and orders reality. Several years ago, I attended a presentation. A white female scholar was researching the lived experiences of young Black adults, young Black male adults. She included that the, that the life they lived was structured by poverty, employ, under, underemployment, violence, crime, single parenthood, undereducation, among others. And she represented this as a new normal. I asked for whom was this normality new? Her interpretive lens, her metaphors of their lived exper experiences represented what Buenda calls cultural baggage. He says, a demonstration of the embeddedness of beliefs and assumptions in our epistemological and ontological systems. In short, these influenced how she came to understand and see the young men she was researching. Her ontological commitments were portrayed by her beliefs and assumptions about the life world of those she was researching, resulting in the metaphor of the new normal that directed how she consumed and conceptualized their experiences. Metaphors are the interpretive prism, framing our beliefs and support our assumptions and supporting our, our assumptions, particularly about the racialized other for the purpose of maintaining the status quo. Belinda says, societal and cultural metaphors structure researchers' assumptions and worldviews. Prevailing metaphors of the self, the other, and the real have framed how researchers see and know their epistemology, as well as underlie the narrative structures that guide their construction of racial stories. Ontological commitments are therefore deep and enduring. Buinda reminds us that ontological commitments are not just held within whiteness, but people of color also have such commitments. For black and brown people, these ontological commitments are challenges to the negative and demeaning metaphors of white people and others seeking to demoralize them. Their metaphors are structured, as he states, to tell, su to tell such a story uh, requires the teller to mobilize a different set of propositions about oneself, the other, and the past, than what the white mainstream has held is true. It entails reconceptualizing the way society operates and has operated. These metaphors paint a different picture than the one drawn by the pen of hegemony. Race-based epistemologies situate black and brown people as active agents and directors of their destiny, proactively reshaping the contours of how society fits around them, not how they fit into society. They provide an avenue for retelling the story from the perspective of the lion, not the one seeking to kill and claim the lion as a prize. This shifts how they see themselves, whiteness, and the society seeking to preserve it, and creates metaphors that are self-affirming and more accurately representing self and culture symbolically and materially. This provides a blueprint for outsiders seeking to do research within our communities seeking to produce research narratives that invariably become truths. In another project that I'm leading on culturally responsive STEM doctoral mentoring, we shift the, res the responsibility of successful mentoring experiences back to the mentors. Typically, such discussions are framed from deficit perspectives of underrepresented racially minoritized students. My resulting analysis focused on not what students lacked or should do, but on, what mentors need, uh, but on what mentors needed to develop, skills, knowledge, and competencies. Further, the analysis, is, the analysis changed epistemologically how science learning is understood through a concept I term vacuum mentoring. Science learning was portrayed as occurring in cultural isolation with, the, with, the only, cult, with only the cultural science as being relevant. This allowed STEM doctoral mentors to operate with ontological commitments to science that were seen as unbiased and neutral, and to be relieved of engaging with the cultures of their mentees. The prevailing message of the research was that students were not identified as the problem, but mentors were asked to acknowledge their, problem, their problematic epistemologies. As, writers in, as the writers in Interrogating Race suggest, this allowed me to write differently about the racialized other, 
pursuing a STEM doctorate because I could see the racialized other from the perspective of the metaphor created by racialized others, relinquishing hold of ontological commitments I might have held about mentor-mentee relationships, if only briefly. Race-based epistemologies are supported in their methodologies and methods that must be intentionally reshaped. Narrative has been a mainstay in the toolbox of qualitative research because it allows qualitative researchers to explore phenomena through the lens of the individual, an endic view. Narratives are necessarily devices for obtaining rich contextual details relative to the phenomenon. In researching race, these narratives are key as they provide insights that are relevant beyond the individual storyteller, contributing to the larger discourse on race, highlighting aspects that have not been previously identified as significant. Race-based epistemologies support research that is metaphorically, uh, that is metaphorically place-based, rooted in and informed by the community and striving for emancipatory impact. It puts the needs of the community first, is ethical and beneficial. Researchers informed by race-based epistemologies cannot become complicit in maintaining culturally invalidating metaphors. Vargos created a playbook for disengaging the epistemological canons which include personal understanding, transformation, empathy, overcoming one's own racial identity metaphors, and being open-minded and sensitive toward the life experiences of those different than their own. Moving past social imaginaries constructed through one's ontological commitments requires a commitment to challenging closely held truths about the other. Critical race theorists rely on counter storytelling to highlight differing experiences of reality and understandings of truth. This results in qualitative research, uh, this results in qualitative research when informed by race-based epistemologies being informed by values other than that dictated by racialized hegemony, giving priority to the knowledges of oppression and survival, often held by those discriminated against and demoralized through racist practices and research. Lopez and Parker surmise, that epistemologies born from struggle and survival provide unique insights and opportunities, and that these epistemologies allow them to see a different way of doing research altogether. In other words, our hope is, is to not merely tinker with the master's tools of human inquiry in order to make them more user-friendly, but to offer fundamentally different ideas that have serious implications for how we view, understand, and come to know the real. We have, we have to commit to unlearning and relinquishing ontological commitment through that perpetuate white supremacy and sustain white privilege validated through our epistemologies. There is an urgent need to move forward, generate and promote race-based epistemologies because we can't breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary Weather, for that uh, wealth of information. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for a few questions, and uh, we'll try to end as closely to on time as possible. So the first question we have for you is, can you provide an example of an epistemological research question with whiteness in the center or one that is equal? So the question is a... Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, they're asking for a uh, epistemolog. I think they're trying to say epistemological research question with whiteness in the center. With whiteness in the center? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, many of our questions, pretty much all of the questions that we ask, um, for instance, uh, a, thinking about the study that we, we were doing with regards to uh, mentoring, um, asking questions about, um, uh, from a constructivist uh, standpoint, that's asking us to build and develop our understandings of mentoring based on experiences, but the experiences are automatically centering um, whiteness. And so if we are not intentional about interrogating the ways in which race um, impact that, 
then you're going to have a question that assumes whiteness as the center um, that is based upon our typical, you know, epistemological research, research canon. And so the, the idea, I think, is that there has to be an intentionality around how we might different, differentially ask questions um, so that we are not working from a, a, a specific uh, framework uh, that does not pay attention to race. I have uh, another question here. What can social scientists do today to move forward in their research in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of what needs to happen is that social scientists need to be uh, better read. They need to read outside of their disciplines and they need to read um, specifically around issues of uh, race and racism, anti-Black racism. Um, and also need to talk with their colleagues. I think that having um, uh, teams that reflect a, a, a broader range of human experiences can also help us in that regard because it will give us different lenses through which we're gonna be looking at the phenomena and therefore we can begin asking different questions about it. Thank you. Uh, could you give a specific example of what you had to point out to the other researchers during the museum study? Sure. Um, one in particular, uh, uh, the, the person had did a, a presentation on um, fashion as documented through museums. And so there's been several um, uh, exhibits that have looked at fashion. And uh, her analysis was that if you look across time at fashion, uh, it has always been about um, uh, exploiting the, the female body. And so the things that were considered fashionable or the things that men, the, the male gaze, would determine as being um, uh, attractive. And the point that I, I raised to, to her was, if I in my black body were to be in that outfit, I would look completely differently. So what are you saying or how are you, how are you accounting for the ways in which um, racialized people may be differently understood in these very same outfits? And so then I brought up the um, conversation that it was maybe a few years back about uh, women wearing leggings, or rather young girls wearing leggings, and there were schools that were banning young black girls from that fashion option because they were being considered as being um, too sexual, but white girls were allowed to wear it because of their body type. And so those are the types of things that I was pointing out with, uh, in terms of um, that, uh, that museum uh, experience is that race and the ways in which we understand uh, live reality and, and people's different, differently experienced um, lived experiences will impact how we understand what we're seeing within, within these exhibits. And so I was highlighting things like that that would um, show that there was a differential experience that was not being attended to at all in their analysis. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, what are some of the practices researchers can do to get in touch with their ontological commitments? Yeah, another great question. Yeah, I think once again, I would say part of it is really engaging in honest reflection and having a trusted other, because sometimes we are, are, are blocking ourselves from really getting in touch with who we are uh, as a defense mechanism. Oh, I'm not that type of person. Oh, I have black friends. <laughs> we need to talk to people who can help move us past some of those immediate defense mechanisms. So I think that's one thing that I think is really, uh, really important to do. I think it's also important um, to read. It's also important to engage in, in a, a wide range of discussions um, once again, I think going outside of our disciplines become really important so that we can hear how others are constructing 
um, ideas and then begin to do that analysis of ourselves to say, well, what is it that I am, that I'm, that, that's getting my attention? And I think that becomes the other thing that um, I think becomes important in trying to understand our on ontological commitments are really paying attention to the, to the little things, you know? Um, I think within education, one of the examples that is often used is, you know, who gets attended to, if you will, during a class discussion. So are you consistently paying attention to uh, the white female, but easily dismissing the conversation that is being brought up by perhaps the, the Latina, right? And it's very subtle. I mean, these are not like huge, overt, you know, in your face, <laughs> uh, microaggression type things, right? But these are the little small things. And I think we have to really be, be paying attention to the little things that we're doing um, with, in our everyday interactions. I mean, it could be as small as you're walking down the street. Um, and this is a phenomenon that I often hear um, black, black people talk about. I'm walking down the street and the expectation is if I see a white person is that I'm gonna move to the side so they can keep going by. Do you have that expectation if you're a white folk, <laughs> right? If you're a white person, those little tiny things, what does that say about how you understand blackness and our um, performance of blackness? So I think it's really paying attention to, to little things, maybe even keeping a little diary of how interactions go, um, what uh, preceded what, what was the consequence of what? Yeah. I, I like that uh, the terminology you use there, the performance of Blackness. That is something I will be using again in my research. So I want to thank you again for being with us today. We do have more questions. I will pull those from the chat and we will try to answer all of those questions via email. I appreciate you all for attending. Uh, Dr. Merriweather, do you have any closing words for us today? Uh, no, I would just say thank you again for the invitation and for all of those who came to um, uh, participate in events that the Data Fair is hosting. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you as well. I hope to see you guys at the next presentation after this, which discusses uh, segregation in integrated schools. So thank you all. Have a good day.